Welcome to History by the Month. It's March, Women's History Month, so for this episode, we're highlighting six trailblazing women who were born in March. Dorothy Height, Jackie Joyner Kersey, Yo-Yo Kusama, Sandra Day O'Connor, Harriet Tubman, and Hannah Wilkie. Collectively, these women are responsible for important achievements and ongoing impacts in a wide variety of fields. We know, of course, there are many more trailblazing women born in March, so please feel free to offer your additional examples in the comments. Let's begin our journey in the early part of the 19th century, March 1822. Harriet Tubman is born. While the specific date of Harriet's birth has not been verified, based on records and accounts of the time, most historians place the date between March 19th and 22nd. Named Araminta Ross when born into slavery, Harriet escaped to freedom in 1849, then returned over and over again freeing slaves via the Underground Railroad and hundreds more while leading black troops during the Civil War. Glennis Brooks extensively researched Harriet to create her one-woman show, Harriet Tubman, an American Hero. Glennis let us film a performance and also shared why she learned about Harriet as she researched her life and why she believes Harriet's story matters to everyone. As I read and I learned about, as General Gold would say, her ingenious generalship, how they would use an arsenal of disguises, sometimes just escaping right in front of the slave owners, and how she traveled 97 miles one way to get to freedom with bloodhounds chasing after her, torches, people crying and screaming after her, and she survived that. I thought this is an incredible story that we really need to know. Oh, oh, oh. Freedom! I got to do my best in every single way. I want to live out the freedom that I have today. I want to honor those who came before me, who fought and died for a life they couldn't see. Freedom! So the name of the show is called Harriet Tubman, an American Hero, and it falls under the category of a one-person show. So it's historical in content, and I play her life from age nine to 92 and I play all of the roles, all of the different stages that she goes through and the characters that she interacts with. And even though you don't have to call nobody massa, and you can spend your money the way you want, you can't even vote. But when I looked at Harriet Tubman's story, well, I thought that that was a story that I knew just like everybody else always feels that they know. But when I started researching, I was really blown away by the incredible energy and strategy that was used through the Underground Railroad and how she succeeded. I have heard that you have made 19 trips secretly to free slaves. Is that true, Harriet Tubman? Oh yes, I freed about 300. We need trustworthy and loyal people like you, Harriet Tubman. Would you be She was the first woman in the military in the United States to create and lead a military campaign. Uh, through some of those, she freed like an additional 700 slaves. She really believed in her freedom. In fact, one of her quotes is that she felt that she had a right to two things, liberty and freedom or death. One thing that the show ends with is she says that whether, whether you're you was born, born on this land, free, free or a slave, or a slave, I want you to keep the fate and remember this: behind every great dream is a dreamer. Harriet's life of activism for both racial and sexual equality continued into the early part of the 20th century until her passing on another day in March, March 10th, 1913. We invite you to learn more about Harriet Tubman in our full video with Glennis Brooks. Just one year before Harriet's death, another civil rights icon was born. March 24, 1912, Dorothy Height is born in Richmond, Virginia. Ms. Height may not be as well known as Harriet Tubman, but her activism and advocacy definitely made a difference. 
After graduating from New York University during the 1930s, she worked with the YWCA in New York and Washington, D.C., focused on issues of segregation, civil rights, and race relations. During that time, a chance meeting with African-American leader Mary McLeod Bethune inspired her to begin working with the National Council of Negro Women, a lifelong relationship that would see her become the organization's president in 1957 and serve in that capacity for 40 years. Through that organization and many others, she focused on the issues of African-American women, including unemployment, illiteracy, and voter awareness, and is credited as the first leader in the civil rights movement to recognize inequality for women and African Americans as problems that should be considered as a whole. As part of the organizing committee for the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, she was instrumental in persuading organizers to include a woman speaker in the program. Frankie Freeman, another civil rights leader who was appointed by Lyndon Johnson as the first woman to serve on the United States Commission on Civil Rights, knew Dorothy Height well. She speaks about her friend and mentor. A dear, dear friend, and my, my, a mentor, and my inspiration. There are times in your life when you meet people that you relate to. And she was one of those. I mean, relate to in ways in which there's anything you can do for them, you will do it. And they help you. And, and she was a very dear friend. And we still think, I still think about Dorothy. For her extraordinary work in 1989, Height received the Citizens Medal Award from President Ronald Reagan, and in 2004 was honored with the Congressional Gold Medal and inducted into the Democracy Hall of Fame International. She passed away on April 20, 2010, at the age of 98. Her funeral was held at Washington National Cathedral. Sandra Day O'Connor is another extraordinary example of a woman making a difference in the fields of law, government, and public policy. Born March 26, 1930, she was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to be the first woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. She was confirmed by the Senate on a 99 to nothing vote and served from September 1981 until her retirement in January 2006. Evan Thomas wrote her official biography and shares his insights on this legendary trailblazer. This is your 10th book, but the title is first. And as I read it, I kept coming back to what a great title that really is, because that is really the essence of what you're exploring here is the burden and the blessing of being first. Both. I mean, she came into a man's man, the law especially, as it was a man's world. I mean, these incredible stories of when she's coming out of law school, high in her class. They didn't keep class rank at Stanford, but maybe number three. Not a single law firm in the state of California will even give her an interview as a lawyer. One gave her an interview to be a legal secretary and asked her how her typing was. That's, you know, she, it was just a dark age compared to today. Not that we don't have ways to go today, but compared to today, it was just the dark ages. So she was not only the first Supreme Court justice, female Supreme but first majority leader of a state Senate in Arizona, of, of, any, of any state, but she was in Arizona. And even first in her family to, to leave the ranch and to go do so many things on her own at such a young age. Uh, she was really always by herself in a way, even though she had a great family support. She was a trailblazer. She had to be brave. Right. She, she had to be, be brave, brave at a very yeah. young age. And you know, although she was enormously confident and comes across that way, she was scared. You know, it was interesting to me, public speaking, for instance. She, she, She's given more speeches than any Supreme Court justice in history. She's been to all 50 states. She's been all over the world preaching the rule of law. But when she was young, she was afraid of public speaking. Her, her law school pal, Beatsy Laws, was really worried about her performance at the moot court, you know, these trial, these competitions in law school, because she was scared of talking. And she herself said that when she was a, a lawyer, you know, her knees would knock and her, her throat would close. She had to overcome a lot of fear, but she did. And you get the sense that it wasn't that she was fearless, but she pushed ahead. Yes. I mean, it was all about overcoming fear. Courage is not not being afraid. It's being afraid and overcoming it. One thing that's very clear, too, in her early life and then in her years in law school is she always knew her own mind. I mean, she certainly had uh, many options and directions she could have gone in, but she wasn't overly influenced by other people. And, and that was true, too, in her choice of partner in John O'Connor. Although I just finished saying that she was scared at times, she had a deep inner 
gyroscope, confidence, whatever you call it. Yeah, kind of a confidence. Even a sense of destiny. She once wrote a note about her own sense of destiny. She had this, some people are just born with it. Not just born with it. Her father, although he's a harsh guy and rude in some ways, loved her and supported her and adored her. And she bathed in that. And her mother loved her and supported her. And she felt their love. And I think that was enormously affirming to her. She was very non-ideological. She was very pragmatic and very balanced. And she didn't really like elaborate jurisprudential theories. Uh, she jokingly said to me, She oh, didn't those, have an agenda beyond. No, she did not. I mean, she really wanted to play it straight. Now, this is a difficult subject because even judges who say they are playing it straight are influenced by their, there's a whole school of legal realism which suggests that all judges are influenced by the hamburger they ate for lunch. I mean, there's no such thing as a truly neutral judge. So, and I, I think there's some truth to that. But she made a super effort to be neutral, to call them as she saw them, on a, on a, on a, you know, listen to the facts, be practical, look at the practical consequences, as opposed to having a certain ideology that drove all her decisions. You can learn more about Justice O'Connor in our full interview with Evan Thomas. From the legal life, we turn our attention to the world of art and focus on two groundbreaking artists born in March. Yayoi Kasama, born March 22, 1929, and Hannah Wilkie, born March 7, 1940. Dana Turkovich, curator of art at Lomar Sculpture Park, tells us more about the living legend Yayo Kusama, and Tamar Schenkenberg, curator at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation, delves into the female-centric work of Hannah Wilkie. Narcissus Garden is a monumentally scaled installation by Japanese contemporary artist Yayo Kusama. The intention behind the work is to invite the viewer in, to sort of envelop the viewer in the installation. So we encourage viewers to come in, to traverse the pathways that we've set out with the installation. It's comprised of almost 1,200 stainless steel reflective spheres. So there's gonna be moments of reflection in there. And that's where the Narcissus aspect of the title comes in. There's an interaction there, and I think inviting our visitors into an environment where they can sort of get lost in these pieces, feeling very, you know, vital but also insignificant at the same time, reflect what's on the outside. So you're seeing yourself, but you're also seeing the environment in your surroundings as well. Kusama was born in Japan in a rural town, Atsumoto, and she began painting when she was 10 years old. And she, at that time, was experiencing hallucinations. And she described it as these almost enveloping dots and lights. And I think that uh, motif of the dot has kind of come through her work to now. She's now working in her 90s and she continues to use that motif and that symbol of the dot in her work. She also describes this use of the dot as a way to manage anxiety and overcome fear. She was really interested in the restaging of the self-obliteration and just kind of getting lost in those dots. And in a way, Narcissus Garden reflects that same idea, where you've got this series of mirrored balls where you can really get lost in it. So in a way, it's kind of how she felt about some of her early paintings that she had made when she moved to New York. She is probably one of the biggest artists in the world right now. She's a very significant, celebrated artist. Hannah Wilkie was a groundbreaking American artist whose boundary-crossing practice lasted from the early 1960s all the way up to her untimely death in 1993. And she said that we as a society are so visually prejudiced that she wanted to make herself very visual to see if she can help us interrogate our own visual prejudices in the world through her art. So throughout her career, she was very much interested in the body, the vitality, 
and the vulnerability of the body and also the body as something that connects us to each other and the way we experience the world. She was also interested in what she saw as social ills, what she thought were devastating effects stemming from misogyny and patriarchy, but also consumerism and capitalism and the way in which bodies are not encouraged to have pleasure, but were twisted into profit in a way that women were objectified to be in the service of those forces. Nature was a big inspiration in her work. She really reveled in the beauty and the symbolism of nature and expressing that full spectrum of our existence here in the world, all the way from birth and growth and blossoming to death and decay. By the mid-1970s, she also starts using her own body in her work, and it was a way for her to really take a hold and take control of her body and be an agent of it, but also express the vulnerability. So later in life, her mother, Selma Butter, falls ill. She experiences breast cancer, and Hannah documents her throughout her illness and eventually makes work in tribute of her mother that we're showcasing here at the Pulitzer, really thinking about the deep bond that exists between a parent and child. And then eventually she herself, unfortunately, is diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and creates a body of work that showcases a lot of frankness and intimacy in the way in which it really depicts cancer, it humanizes the face of cancer. And she was an artist who really championed new ways of art making, pushed against traditional art making practices. She made important contributions to the field of art in terms of her approaches to materials. She very much embraced materials that were soft and malleable, such as clay, chewing gum, kneaded erasers, latex. These were not conventional media in the art world. And she was one of the champions of working outside of traditional boundaries of sculpture and painting. And she really opened the door to new materials, uh, new techniques, and also new imagery. She not only made compelling art, art that was really materially diverse and formally experimental, but some of the issues in her work continue to resonate today. Issues that have to do with equality and agency, the vulnerability of the body. Hannah Wilkie really encouraged people to take pleasure and pride in the body, but she was also aware and really interested in the body's vulnerabilities and that full spectrum of the human existence. To close out this episode, we turn to the world of sport and celebrate the life and legacy of multiple Olympic champion Jackie Joyner Kersey, born March 3, 1962. Considered by many to be the greatest female all-around athlete in history, she's a four-time Olympian in the long jump and heptathlon. Her achievements include three Olympic gold medals, one silver medal, two bronze medals, four World Outdoor Championship gold medals, and the still-standing world record of 7,291 points in the women's heptathlon. She was named the greatest female athlete of the 20th century by Sports Illustrated and in 2023 was inducted into the International Sports Hall of Fame. And all of these achievements were accomplished by an athlete with severe asthma. But JJK's contributions extend far beyond the world of sports. She's an active philanthropist in children's education, racial equality, and women's rights. She is a founder of the Jackie Joyner Kersey Foundation, which encourages young people in her hometown of East St. Louis, Illinois, to pursue athletics and academics. And she collaborated with Comcast to create the Internet Essentials Program, which provides high-speed Internet access to low-income Americans. Let's hear from Jackie herself why she believes it's so important to give back to the community. Growing up in East St. Louis uh, with a family, uh, young teenage mom and dad, uh, older brother and two younger sisters and we lived in my great grandmother home and uh, my mother uh, and father instilled in us a commitment to hard work setting goals and we couldn't really worry about what we didn't have because at <coughs> times uh, we didn't have food to eat we didn't have a uh, uh, warm shelter but we had a lot of love in our home and, and really a lot of faith and, and trust. And so uh, as a young girl and go, going to a community center, being exposed to uh, the fun of athletics and 
not knowing that uh, that would afford me the opportunity eventually to pick my school of choice and be able to travel the world and to meet people from all walks of life. But East St. Louis, for me, has always and will be home. When I think about it all and, and being able to have a dream and set goals and having people to see the potential in me and believe in me to allow me to see my dreams become a reality, which have driven me back to the community to give back. Because at that time, volunteer was a big word and volunteers made a difference. You know, when my family could not afford for me to go or have the right shoes or the right clothes, those volunteers made a difference. And so that stayed with me. Unfortunately, I lose my mother uh, to the worst form of meningitis and come back home and want to go to a center where people had poured into me and the center had uh, padlocks on the door. And I just started thinking, where do the young people go? So at the age of 18, I knew, and it was my hope uh, one day to open up that center because it had an impact on my life and connected me you know, to my extended family, uh, the senior citizens that were in the center. We did the Meals on Wheels program, Arts and Crafts, Catherine Dunham, who had grew up in the community, and we would do dance technique. I learned to strategize at the center, learned to play sports, learned to um, just do a lot of things that really uh, I didn't know at that time had impact on my life, but it did. And the least I could do was to come back and give back of my time.